All right, welcome to this very important episode on the Corporate Transparency Act. You know, a lot of people have not heard of this. It is very concerning. It is a massive encroachment from the government on individuals, small business owners, and all those who deal with small businesses. In order to help fight this in the courts, we have a fundraiser on August 17th in Springville, Utah. It is called the Save the Ranchers Rifle Roundup. And this is for all small businesses, by the way. It's not just ranchers. It's you've, you, If you've got an LLC or an S-Corp or a limited partnership or a PLC, this will affect you. So this is a very important issue. We're fighting against it in the courts. You can help by going to savetheranchers.com. We are having an all-day tactical rifle training. For $250, you get a $400 value. Great trading from Cowboy Tactical Training. A great lunch, and you'll be able to be there with individuals like Marlo Oaks, the Utah State uh, Treasurer, Phil Lyman, candidate for governor, myself and my wife will be there, Gail Ruzica from, from the Eagle Forum, etc. So go to savetheranchers.com, go up at the top to the roundup tickets, and put in my code CWIC quick. I would love to see you there. All right, welcome to Quick Show. My name is Greg Matson, and I am your host. In this episode, we are bringing on Philip Taylor from the Homestead Liberation League and constitutional attorney Austin Hepworth. Welcome, guys. Thanks for having us. Good to be here. We are talking about the Corporate Transparency Act. This is something that most people have not heard of. It is seemingly, as I've gone through the research on this, a very possible, maybe absolute encroachment on civil liberties and the Bill of Rights. Um, Phil, will you tell us just a little bit about what the Corporate Transparency Act is? Yeah, so basically it's it's all under the auspices of fighting terrorism and money laundering, right? But what it is, is it is a, a mandate that all businesses that are small businesses in the United States have to provide personal private information of what's of all of their owners and what's called beneficial owners. Um, so where these terms, how these terms are actually defined is where it gets really kind of sketchy, but basically just on the high level, you have to provide personal information about these people um, in your organization, including identifying documents and photocopies of those identifying documents so that they can use that information to determine whether or not you're involved with terrorism or money laundering. They can share that information with international governments um, that they are friendly with. um, So they could give them a copy of your passport if they wanted to. And if uh, this is all under the auspices of fighting suspected crime, and if they, if you don't comply with it, then the penalties are severe and criminal. Um, It's a $500 a day penalty for failure to comply and up to two years in prison. And if that information isn't updated, those, those penalties are the same. So let's say that, you provided a copy of your driver's license and you moved and you get a new driver's license. If you don't update uh, the financial crimes enforcement network, which is a part of the treasury within 30 days, then you start stacking up a $500 a day fine. Yeah, that's, that's pretty intense. Austin, what, uh, from what I understand, this was passed in 2021. It's now going into effect. And by the end of the year, this year, 2024, all of this information has to be, well, I received an email. My LLC received an email saying that I had to provide all of this information by the end of the year. Is that correct? Yeah. So for any LLC that's existing or corporation or other entity filed with the state, if it existed before 2024, you have until the end of the year to provide it. But any entity that's filed this year, you have 60 days after it's filed. Okay. And does this include, let's talk about small businesses because you guys are somewhat representing homesteaders, farms, right? So are we including LLCs, S corps, limited partnerships, PLCs, et cetera? Yes. Okay. So all small business entities outside of, you know, it's not an entity, but so if you've got a small business and you are not a sole proprietor, then this applies to you. Correct. And it's, it's important to understand that if you filed something with the state, some type of entity with the state. Um, Some people still call themselves a sole proprietor because you can be taxed as that. So just to make sure we clarify for anyone listening that if you have an entity filed with the state, um, 
chances are very high that you need to comply. Or, now, this is to both of you, what what are your biggest concerns with the CTA, with the Corporate Transparency Act? I, I have a number of very big ones. Um, so one is just from a fundamental check and balance uh, constitutional perspective, the regulation of businesses has been the state's domains for centuries now. The federal government hasn't gone into that realm. And the CTA is a direct uh, attempt by the government. It's a, it's openly stated that the federal government says, we're getting sick of the states and the different information they require. We can't get all the info we want. So we're going to pass a uniform standard for business registration. And so the feds are now venturing into the realm of regulating something that's been the states for centuries. Um, some people, you know, don't care. They kind of shrug their shoulders and say, well, if the state can do it, who cares if it's the fed or the state? But one of the things that happens extensively is that states choose to regulate businesses differently to incentivize or promote different types of conduct, different types of businesses, different types of economy within their states. And every state gets to do it differently. And it creates a very strong overall fabric to America because business owners do choose state by state what works best for them. Um, but from an even deeper perspective and a more troubling perspective to me is just the practical reality that I can be listed as a beneficial owner on someone else's business. And if that business does something, um, if they speak out against, let's say the war in Israel or do whatever, you know, their, their political activities are, then these other countries can request to know who the beneficial owners are. They can get their passport or their driver's license. They can get this different information and they're allowed to use it for law enforcement purposes which means that without a warrant, without anything, the U.S. just hands these countries my information, says, yeah, Austin's associated with these entities, these groups. And then these governments, if I happen to travel there, there can be a warrant for my arrest. Um, and the same concern takes place in the U.S. The federal government can use any of this information for law enforcement purposes. States, if they want it, this is ironic, because the states regulate businesses they're the ones that choose what information you provide or don't. But if they want the information that you've had to give to the federal government, they have to get a warrant, which is appropriate um, based on the Bill of Rights. But the federal government doesn't. And so the IRS and these others can look at it and go, oh, look, you were listed as being connected to this business. You know, this business had some tax issues. We now want to see your stuff. Um, and that's just a, a basic thing but when we go to the level of really understanding what this does for political association and free speech rights if one of the fundamental abilities to associate if you have that freedom you have to be able to do it in private you have to be able to say we're going to associate together and it's private and it's we have the ability to speak under a different name so the homestead liberation league for example they can speak as a group and individuals that may be targeted at their work or employment or other places where it may not be uh, favorable to say certain things, um, seek that refuge in association with others and in groups. And that's a consistent theme of liberty. It's a consistent hallmark of it. And if the government can now know all of the main people associated with any group, their identities, where they live, you know, updated within 30 days to track everything, um, I believe very strongly will start to significantly weaken the local communities and little pockets of freedom and liberty and people working for good things. And it'll make it far easier to target and harass and do other things. You know, here's a question. You know, I, I, I know people that attended January 6th and mm -hmm. they had nothing to do with much of anything. They were just there. Right. And I, I know these individuals, I have know these individuals that have had their accounts frozen, their bank accounts frozen. They've had to move banks. Um, just unbelievable stuff for simply being there. And, you know, not going into the, 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 uh, um, into the capital or anything, right? And, and so here's something where if you talk about similar things or political things on either side of the spectrum, you're, you've got a the these departments that are under the executive branch 
that have been weaponized already and being are being more and more weaponized against political speech. <clears throat> you know, now you've got basically the CTA empowers FinCEN to function as a domestic and a global tipster, basically, that can tip off everyone from, um, you know, international law enforcement, uh, international intelligence agencies, U.S. intelligence agencies, the IRS, state and local law enforcement agencies to do not just, you know, freeze, uh, you know, accounts and whatnot because of political speech, but, but to do pretty much anything they want as far as sharing this information and, and tipping off all of these agencies. Isn't that a bill of rights problem? It's a, it's a major one. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, our, our case itemizes a ton of the Bill of Rights violations it's got. I mean, to your, to your concern there, that, that's really the deepest concern to me is, is first of all, that one of the things that uh, if you get into the, the act itself, its terms are vague. And that gives, and, and they're like, hey, we, don't worry, we'll define the terms as we go, which gives them a lot of latitude to redefine things. But the scary thing about it is uh, if, if I am a, if I'm just a regular person, even if I'm not a business owner, if I'm just a regular person walking around, but I happen to be really good friends with a business owner, or I happen to be, um, you know, I, I let's say I'm somebody who gives uh, business advice or something like that, or I'm an employee that the CEO really trusts, and he gives me a lot of influence over marketing decisions in the company, then I can be deemed as a beneficial owner. And so what people have to realize is that really what this does to some extent is it really discourages people from exercising the First Amendment rights because not only does it create the problem of communities coming together, but think about it in these terms. If there's potential economic consequences just for being associated to somebody else, like you're talking about with like January 6th, then all of a sudden people are going to be really careful about whether they go into business and form an entity, right? Because now me running a business now makes me a political risk for everybody around me. It makes me, it makes me, a, you know, a threat to them. And so it discourages me from in, engaging in commerce in a legally secured way. Like I can go be a sole proprietor, but there's a lot of legal consequences and, and uh, ramifications of being a, a true sole proprietor. And so there's all sorts of violations. Like it, it violates your Fourth Amendment rights to privacy. It violates your rights to due process. Um, as Austin was mentioning, uh, only the states have to get uh, have to get a warrant and or, or a subpoena. And what's the point of that? That an unbiased third party, a judge supposedly, is reviewing the evidence against you. They don't just issue it to anyone, but they can give that information to a foreign government without. That so that means that China could you know a, a law enforcement department in China could contact in and say hey we're we're worried that Greg's involved with um, with money laundering so can you just go ahead and send us all the businesses he's associated with all the private information about this so that we can we can check in on that and now now you're now you're a threat to all those around you all those people that were listed as as potential beneficial owners which is hard to define to begin with. And so you just go through the Bill of Rights and it's over and over. It's it's forcing us to report on ourselves, which is another violation of our rights. I mean, our, our case lays it out. But to me, the, the deepest concern is that it's it's a way of intimidating Americans um, indirectly about our right to express ourselves. And it's a way of intimidating us to avoid entering into the most upwardly mobile aspect of our economy, and that is entrepreneurship. Yeah, it, it just seems to me that it, it, two things. Number one, it is a killer to the economy eventually if, when start, people start to realize what this means and how it works. I mean, it's only going to take a few high-profile cases where, where this comes up and where, where, just like with the Patriot Act, where it is the government becoming like a bully because of this intelligence, this information that they have that is going to start exactly what you said, Philip, where, where it's going to be, how do I, you know, do I do I do business with this person, right? Or, or are they on the list, right? If they're blacklisted, then, you know, am I going to do business with this, with this company? It's kind of like saying, well, I may not know their ESG score, so to speak, 
Right. Right. That, that Which I, that will be a natural. We'll, we'll need those. So that way we can properly, you know, vet each other. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, well, what's your, what's your ESG score? How, are you on the list? You know, it, it's, that's right. That is really concerning. And, and so that also though is going to depress the economy. It's going to depress, you know, it, it's going to say, are you in the accepted group politically, uh, the politically correct group? of entrepreneurs, of, of small businesses for me to work with you. And, and if not, then I'm not going to work with you. And it almost creates almost like this underground uh, group of people, if they're not politically correct, so to speak, that are going to be having to do business with each other because they're blacklisted. Does, does, does that make sense, Austin? Or, or am, I, am I just way off the, way off the, uh, the ranch here? No, and this, this already happens. So for example, um, I have a client who's you know you, you when you when you're in the business space and you try and raise some funds what happens is if you have a close family member get arrested for something some felony they did or whatnot suddenly investors may not invest in your business anymore because of something your dad did or your brother did there's already this notion of we have to stay clean stay you know 10 feet away from trouble type thing um or 100 feet away from trouble and so people already do that. And to your point with the, um, with January 6th, that is a serious point because there was almost a million people at that rally on January 6th. And very few of those went to the Capitol after talking percent wise, very few went over. But like you say, the, the FBI said, it's our goal to contact every single person there. And we're going to go through and part of what's happening is there's America is really pushing and society is really pushing for this guilt by association type uh, mentality. And, and people are feeling it where we may not consciously recognize it, but we are deeply concerned when someone starts saying something wild, because what happens is if your CEO of a business says something wild, suddenly your whole business gets blacklisted um, for good or bad. And, and I'm even talking about among consumers. Consumers will do this. Um, people will say, you know, let's boycott. And, but from a legal perspective, if you look at things, what's happening more and more is that uh, if you have a situation of child abuse and a, a dad that was abusing a child, they'll arrest the mom too for failure to report. Um, so this mom could be in a really tough situation trying to figure out what to do. She's terrified of the dad, but she doesn't report the abuse they're arresting the mom too and the dad or you have the one michigan situation where the son went to school the parents didn't take him home he shot people there and now the parents are in jail um for that as well and and they always pick kind of more fringe cases or more serious cases to make big examples of but i think people start to understand that there is some level of guilt by association that's creeping in we're pushing people more and more there's another one i saw where a lady committed suicide and they have now charged her boyfriend with manslaughter for bullying her so extensively um, to do that. Now, is it possible, you know, that someone could be so abusive and things they could drive them to that? Yes. I'm not, I'm not saying it's not possible. Um, but more and more when someone commits suicide, we want to go after all the bullies out there. We want to go after all these other people. And then if you were tangentially associated and you didn't report and you didn't say something, um, you know, there's this saying that's becoming popular, silence is violence and things. Mm -hmm. And what this does is when you then take all these societal concepts and you impose this thing of saying, oh, look, guess what, Phil? Um, we do some business together and as an attorney, I give you advice. And so I actually am, you know, maybe falling under the substantial control thing. So even as an attorney giving advice to an extent, I may be considered a quote beneficial owner of some entities if I tell them, no, you can't do something and then they don't do it or whatnot. Um, but if I'm and associated with every single one of those entities, then yeah, I am going to be concerned and say, do I want to be associated with all these entities? Because if they're going to go do something crazy, could it destroy my life? Um, and this is a level of fear. I believe very strongly that liberty, the state of liberty requires that we're able to just trust people to a certain level and work together. Mm -hmm. 
Laws like this destroy that trust. And it's a fundamental breakdown. It's a fundamental attack on liberty because it destroys the trust that's necessary for liberty to exist. I have to be able to work with Phil and others to the extent of saying, yeah, I trust you to this level. I don't have to trust you with everything. I don't give, give my bank account number, but we at least need to be able to associate without fear that I'm going to get in trouble if you do something bad. But now the CTA just comes in and says, Austin, if any of those you associate with closely does something bad, then well, you all you already that. see this on social media, just with individuals, right. right? It's a matter of do I associate with this person? If I don't block them, if I if I like anything that they say, then how do I look if I'm associating myself with this person that has completely opposite political views, as an example, right? Or and either side, right? It works. It works pretty much both ways. And so I think the more information we have personally in our businesses that becomes online or at least transparent to the government, as an example with the Corporate Transparency Act, then certainly people are going to be having more of an arm's length relationship. It's it, That seems to be happening with everything. It seems to me, Phil, that, that we're, especially with this act, where, where, where the, the reasoning behind it is money laundering and terrorism. It seems to me that the you you have more the tail wagging the dog, right? It, it's it's the tail wagging the dog. An excuse for this is terrorism. And could it help? Sure. I don't know how much the Patriot Act actually has helped us with terrorism. There were there's been several hearings on this showing that it didn't really help that much at all in several examples. Um, but it, it, it's a it's power begets power. And so it's like, well, if we can do a better job a little bit in the FBI or or with the IRS or whatever it is, then we're going to go seek it. But they're going to do right. it in a way that, you know, the ends justify the means and they're going to trample on the Bill of Rights. So is it don't we have a tail wagging the dog in this situation? Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like there's I mean, there's two two big things with it. I mean, first of all, you're, you're absolutely right. And I mean, this is what people have to accept. I mean, terrorism is always the, it's that funny thing now, you know, 20, 23 years later, it's, it's the catch all, right? Like, well, it's like the war of drugs was in the nineties, right? It's, it's, well, we're fighting terrorism. So just you, if you ask questions, are you, are you in favor of the ter terrorists? Like that's really what it boils down to. And mm -hmm. um, especially, uh, it's just especially become the case like, hey, we're, we're trying to fight terrorism. And so I, I agree it is a tail wagging the dog. But the thing that people have to like the government's not going to do it. But the thing that Americans have to accept is that part, part of the price of liberty is some some loss of the sense of security. Right. Like we can have you, you can. The, the parent dilemma of do you lock your kids up in a safe space all the time so that they never get injured or do you let them go outside and play and they might scrape their knee or might get hurt? Uh, like what, what's the better, what's, what's the best thing to have? And uh, as Americans, we, at least in our founding concept, we adopted the idea that we would pursue the risks associated with allowing people their freedoms and protecting their privacy and the challenge is, is that obviously government bureaucracy is always going to try to expand its behavior and it's always going to try to make it easier to do its own job. Um, and, and being able to collect information on everybody would definitely make it easier for them to do some aspect of their job. But the problem is, is that uh, it's, it's almost, uh, I would say, almost counterproductive because if you're swimming in a sea of data, then you don't necessarily know what data is valuable and isn't. And so... The problem is, is you collect information. There's 32 million small businesses in America. Who's reviewing all this data? Who is checking in on this private information? Well, really, the truth is the information sitting there waiting to be utilized when they need to. And then the problem you've got, like Austin's talking about, is being associated with somebody. So the, the thing that scares me is not only does it break trust with our government and our government is treating us all as presumed criminals, but it actually breaks trust uh, in in our entrepreneurial endeavors, because now I have to ask you if we're going into business together and during our time of being in business together, who are your personal close associates? Who do you associate with? Because it's not enough for me to know that you're clean. I now need to know the people you're associated with are clean, because if at some point they decide that your wife has who is very outspoken about a certain issue, 
um, they decide that she was a beneficial owner in our company because you listened to her counsel. And now mm -hmm. we're all associated to whatever she's seeing and doing. So are, are spouses uh, required to be placed on there as beneficial owners? They can be. It's it's all. So this is the problem. The term beneficial owner, first of all, has no analog in U.S. law. So there's not anywhere that says like this is the definition of beneficial owner. Uh, the term actually comes from certain international laws that exist out there. But basically, it's anybody that exercise that owns 25 percent or more of the company or they exercise substantial indirect control over the company. But define what substantial indirect control is. If your wife says, don't buy this or says you should invest in that, is that and you listen to her, is that substantial control? Hmm. It's indirect, uh, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, the issue on trust is really interesting because we're already in a society right now where the level of trust in our institution is at an all time low. Right. Whether whether it's government, education, law, uh, uh, et cetera. Right. I mean, the, 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 the big business, you know, our, our level is so low with, with with these institutions that now as we carry this, it's almost like a spiral where as we move this to small business and individuals. Um, that level of trust is falling further and further and further. And you cannot hold up a democracy that way. It's impossible. Right. As you said, I think it's a very good point. You have to have a level of trust for democracy to work. Right. Um, Austin, question for you on this. This seems to me that when you are putting this information out as a small business owner to the government, uh, you know, here, here's what the fifth, I mean, it's a fifth amendment question, right? The fifth amendment says that you, uh, th that you don't have to provide, no person shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself. Is this providing, are you becoming a witness against yourself with your small business information as you're, as you're, uh, giving this to the government at all? I would say yes. Um, from a legal perspective, that one's a little bit harder because the constitution does say in a criminal proceeding and technically there's no criminal proceeding yet, which is why the fourth amendment is the one that covers it more closely that says, even when there's no criminal proceeding, you can't come take my stuff. Um, and so those two work together, I think where the fourth amendment says prior to there being anything criminal, you can't just come take my stuff. The fifth amendment says once there is something criminal and you've charged me with something, you can't compel me to be a witness. Um, but because of that little qualifier about in a criminal proceeding, mm -hmm. the courts usually treat those two separately. So for example, they do allow me, they do allow the IRS to force me to proactively send my information to them. Um, I'm kind of being a witness against myself in those situations. You know, I'm, I'm saying something I'm compelled under law to disclose things. Um, but yes, I think from a, a perspective of a true originalist intent constitutional look at the Constitution and Bill of Rights, I think the founders would be very appalled by a system that just says, just send it all in. We just want all this information. We're gathering it and we can use it against you later. Um, but I, I do think that they would have seen a strong connection between the two like you're making. But I think they would have found most of it sitting in the Fourth Amendment rather than the Fifth. Um, but two, and I just wanted to say quickly to one of the questions you said about a spouse being a beneficial owner, this term beneficial owner, when it talks about exercising substantial control directly or indirectly over a business. So any of your executive level officers would be a beneficial owner. But when it says anyone that indirectly exercises substantial control over a company, then yeah, that could be your spouse. Um, I think a lot of small business owners would be a spouse. But even more troubling, there's there's two sides to this now, too. Um, there's one where I know everything and I have to choose what I report. Um, but there's a second where I'm a business owner, but I don't know everything. Who's my CEO sleeping with? And who are they talking to? Because that person could be exercising indirect control over the entity through the CEO. The CEO, to keep a romantic relationship alive, could be doing whatever this person tells them to. Um, how do I know that as a business owner to report that? Because the reason that the government wants that is they're saying, look, what happens is they're, they're, what they claim is Iran can buy oil tankers, for example, from the United States because they can set up these shell entities 
we don't know who's involved. And then they hire just some person that doesn't know anything, but there's someone else really telling them what to do. And they go, we want all this stuff reported so that we can figure out how Iran's getting to be able to purchase a $25 million oil tanker. And, and I, I look at that and I go, well, there's a whole uh, boatload of issues with that still, because to your point about the tail wagging the dog too, is, is Iran going to report any of its beneficial owners to the government? If, if they're here to do something illegal, they're not going to come in. They're not going to care about a $500 a day fine. Um, that's only going to impact the law abiding citizens. Um, but from the second side, if you're the business owner tasked with compliance and you don't report one of these indirect relationships that somebody has that's controlling your entity, um, then what do you do? You know, you're just in trouble again because someone did something they didn't disclose. So as a small business owner, you have to start asking questions like, who do you sleep with? Who are you talking to? Um, it's incredibly invasive to try and comply. And some people, you know, some, I think government officials might roll their eyes at that and be like, oh, we would never require that. And you go, no, you're going to find a company that they were having some relationship on the side and that person was controlling the company and you're going to come after them. Um, as part of this and it will certainly happen. And so again, these things cause all kinds of constitutional issues um, that, that I think the founders were very aware of. They lived under the abuses of a king that could just demand whatever and just say, give it to me. They, they knew what that was like and they knew that in order to keep power from becoming uh, tyrannical like a king, you had to put a check on what the government could take up front. And you had to be able to place this level of private association and liberty, again, depends on that. Communism, China knows that you have to have small pockets of community and association. China works very aggressively to break down pockets of association. So even MLMs are illegal in China because one of the things that MLMs do that counter communism is they form pockets of communities. And communism can't have that. It's a threat to communism. And so in America, when I watch these laws come in that are incredibly invasive, that almost require me to report on a neighbor, um, because now I'll get in trouble, it is, it's absolutely breaking down this trust, this liberty. And to me, it's a very, it's absolutely a precursor to a far more tyrannical type of government coming in because we no longer trust when we no longer trust each other, we ask the government to solve our problems. Um, and if we can make us all reporters on each other, where we're now mandatory reporters of everybody and everything, um, liberty's gone at that point. It doesn't exist. Yeah, and you can just see, you know, eventually, pretty quickly, actually, you can see a lot of companies saying, okay, yeah, we're interested in this. Here's a contract that we're going to look at, and here's a, a survey uh, questionnaire that we want you to fill out as well. That's going to have all these questions that you're talking about right now, right? We need you to include all these things so that we can make a, a clear judgment on whether or not you're somebody that we're going to want to pursue doing business with. Yep. And 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 then you're also sharing a lot of information there. You would have you'd be sharing that with other businesses because yep. you they, who who wants the liability. Who's right. going to want the liability of, of getting involved with someone who's going to be in trouble and how that maybe your information is going to be uh, included. You talk about, you know, let's say, for example, that you're going to have your business information, your personal information shared with international or, you know, other countries and their, their intelligence agencies and law enforcement agencies. Well, does that include the people you do business with? Why not? Right. Wouldn't that all of a sudden you're, you're creating a chain, a train of information that says, here is this person and here's everybody that they do business with. And, and we have their information also. Here is the whole thing, right? Yep. Yeah. yeah and I mean, you also have the fact that, uh, I mean, you also have the very real fact that this is to some extent, whether intentionally or not, is discouraging entrepreneurs from existing because just complying with this, uh, the NSBA who did the original lawsuit in Alabama, they, uh, they have over 5,000 business owners in their, in their organization. And they estimated that it was going to cost the average business $8,000 a year or in their first year 
to comply. And then you would still have ongoing legal costs because it's not enough for you to figure out who your beneficial owners are. You you really need to review with an attorney, is this person a beneficial owner? And attorneys have been wrong. I've, I've read several different things where attorneys have disagreed about things in the act. And so really it becomes up to the, it comes down to the enforcement department defining its own terms and what will end up happening. I mean, think about it. If you're starting a small business, you might only have a few thousand dollars period and you're starting something out. And now you're tasked with mo- like this massive amount of compliance requirements. That's why a lot of states like Utah have very, very low cost barrier to entry to forming an LLC and to getting a business started because it helps encourage people to be entrepreneurs. But when you're looking at this type of compliance costs, you're going to see a consolidation of wealth. You're going to see a consolidation of the marketplace because the barrier to entry just got higher and more difficult and it has to be managed. There's more required bureaucracy in your business now in order to run a business. Yeah. Um, well, let me ask you guys, are there any other major concerns that we haven't touched on here that that you that you see with the CTA? Yeah, I think there's... Um... So one of the one of the things that that I look at is it's called the Corporate Transparency Act, but it regulates small businesses. Is what? Could you say that again? It's called the Corporate Transparency Act, but it regulates small businesses, and it specifically excludes from its regulation any large corporation. And a large corporation is an entity that makes twenty million or more a year. Um, Five million. Or, or sorry, five million or more a year. Saying twenty because the employees and has twenty or more employees, so it's it's an and. Um, so if if you're a business actually large enough to launder money and do things, um, you're excluded from this. That act. is really well. Are there other provisions elsewhere in the law that cover those companies? So they they've said that in court filings as a justification. They said, well, anyone that's exempt from this is regulated by something else. And some of the some of the places have some level of regulation on them, but I've asked accountants, I've asked attorneys, I've asked others. I said, "Do you know of any single law that has a different regulation that comes over you reporting to the government or anything when you make five million or more a year and have twenty or more employees?" And everyone I've asked so far says, "I have no idea. Never heard of anything like that." And so that that one definition, you know. So for example, once you're approved as a nonprofit association you're exempt from this. You don't have to comply with the uh, CTA anymore, but you have to comply before you're exempted. And it usually takes 10 months to a year to get the IRS approval for that. Um, They do have some level of reporting um, that exists and some level of disclosure, not to the same extent that this exists. There's just more financial as opposed to relationship based. Um, So yes, they, they say things like that, but I look at that and I go, we need to look at this not also not as an island um, because one of the when I look at the um, kind of what are the foundations of liberty when we're talking about people or groups, I believe there's two very strong groups that have existed in society that really carry a lot of the liberty mentality, liberty spirit with them. One is entrepreneurs. they're very, liberty-minded, they go, you know, do their own thing. And another is homeschoolers. And the homeschool groups tend to be very independent, very much, hey, let us do our thing. And so it's interesting to watch as these types of regulations roll out because we had the CTA get passed in 2021, come into effect in 2024. And Utah, and this is something I think we'll start seeing in more and more places as well, but suddenly Utah has a bill come up at the state level that says, hey, homeschoolers, we know there's a lot of you. And sometimes you have trouble finding places to meet in co-ops or different groups where you get together because of zoning laws. So for example, they may want to meet at an office building or a church or whatever. And the zoning laws will say, hey, you can't have a school here, so you can't be here. And so Utah says, guess what? We're going to offer protection to you. So we will let you operate as a homeschool co-op in any zone that exists in the state, provided that you form an entity. Hmm. So if you form an entity, um, we'll give you some nice protection. We'll let you go anywhere you want in the state. But you look at that in connection and go, well, why do you have to form an entity to have protection? 
well, if you again, if you look at the the accumulation thing, suddenly, if you want protection, you want to be able to go and do your homeschool stuff wherever. Now you have to create an entity, and now you're disclosing everyone that's in charge of that to the federal government. Um, and then you put that in connection here in Utah as well. And again, I, I know the Utah side because I'm here, but I'm sure this is similar in a lot of states. Um, Utah passes a, uh, a scholarship where they say the theory is that if you homeschool or private school, you've saved the state money because your kids aren't in the school system. And so in Utah, I think they say you save the state $9,500 a year. So the state says, we'll give you 8,000 of that to help you homeschool or private school. Um, so homeschoolers and private schoolers can apply to receive $8,000 a year per child. But in this bill that was passed four times, it specifically says that every single person that takes these funds is subject to um, a federal regulation. And they, so they, Utah has created this direct tie to homeschoolers and the federal government, where the federal government can update this law. Sorry, I said federal regulation, federal law. It's a law of Congress. Um, wow. They can update it anytime, and they have a direct link to regulate all homeschoolers and private schoolers in Utah who take this money. And again, I, I look at these things and I, I say, we need to be very aware of this as a people to recognize that piece by piece, part by part, when you pass the Corporate Transparency Act and you say, disclose all your associations, and then you say to the homeschoolers, you can get protection if you create an entity. These things work together. And the government, I believe, is very much looking at understanding connections among all the liberty-based people and looking at how that works, how it operates. And they have to get into these private realms and private groups. And most liberty-based things stay smaller. They're not large companies. Uh, liberty is a community-like thing. And so this is a regulation on small community. And that, to me, is just one of the biggest takeaways in my mind is that the government's coming after the small people to stop terrorism or money laundering, but it's not the small people doing these things. And those that are money doing money laundering and terrorism, they're not going to comply. This is only something that they are getting information on the law-abiding citizens from. Yeah, this is really interesting. I mean, I, that's not something I had thought of. So I, I didn't even know about it. But you're so anyone doing five million or over is exempt from this. If they that's have really where you're going to find the money laundering. Yeah, assuming uh, I, I mean, that they if, have if someone's employees money too. laundering, whether it's drugs or terrorism or anything, arms or anything else, you, that, that's not going to do anything if you're under five million dollars. You're going to have right. to go out and find a hundred different small companies to be right. able to do what you want to do. So that's that's really interesting. And, and the second thing is the homeschooling. That is interesting because you know they're going to come after homeschooling because it is growing in popularity very, very quickly. They're outside, number one, of, again, a, a government purview on, to some degree at least, on, on, on education with the kids already. Um, that's, that's really very interesting. Here's a question for either of you. Uh, I know that this was in the, in the – well, let me ask you this first, uh, if either of you know this. Who brought this bill forward? To begin with, I don't know the exact people. The history of it was it came uh, kind of individually, and it wasn't. It had mixed reception at the start when they tried to get it through. The international communities had this for a while, and they've been pushing America to implement it. Um, and so, what ended up happening was in 2020 it got added as part of the national defense um, authorization bill. Yes. And so it was a small part of it. It was a 1500 page bill altogether. And I'm just oh, wondering, I'm wondering who bill. added it and who their, let's just call it their sponsors were. Right. Yeah. No, I, I don't know that answer as to who the specific okay. person was. And then I know that this was in the courts for a while. It was being, I know they had appealed it, et cetera. Is this still in the courts at all, or is it just gone and done? No, there's there's still uh, there's a total of six cases that have been filed that I'm aware of so far. Um, Alabama, the Alabama case had a ruling at the district level, but the uh, and the judge ruled that it was unconstitutional. But he only provided relief for the plaintiffs. So if somebody's a part of the NSBA, then they have relief. But that's five thousand out of thirty two million, right? Uh, there are five other cases, uh, and my guess is is that 
the district court, or, uh, sorry, the district court will get appealed, the one in Alabama. Um, we have our own case that we filed here in Utah this last Monday, so not today, but, or sorry, not yesterday, but the week before. And there's several cases aimed at stopping it, but nothing's had a, other than the Alabama case, that there hasn't been a single ruling as, as far as I'm aware yet. Do, do you do you believe that there's a chance that this ends up at the Supreme Court? Does it have yes, enough? We, do, do, the, do the cases have enough teeth? Yes. Um, one of the great things that's happening is, again, from a liberty perspective, this is something I love to see, is we talk about these cases. They're filed in different circuits, Court of Appeals, so they have different Court of Appeals they'll go through. And chances are decent based on the court system in America that there's different rulings that come out. Some win, some lose. Um, but when you have when you have a situation, if if we get through with some wins and some losses, the government can't enforce its law very well when half the country is excluded and half of it's not. And so in those cases, when you have a circuit split and multiple courts have ruled on it, and the federal government appeals because they've lost something in one of those, um, the Supreme Court has a very high obligation to step in on federal laws like this to give the government the ability to have a yes or no type answer. Um, we believe there's a lot of potential at the Supreme Court right now. And so it is, again, one of the neat things about seeing all the different people doing something because win or lose at the district court, win or lose at the appellate court, it's it's likely creating a very strong scenario for the courts, the Supreme Court to take it. They don't like to take it just a one-off case that only one court heard and only one appellate court looked at. They like to see both sides of the arguments. They like to see how judges come down on it before they take a case. And so it's it's setting itself up nicely to get to the Supreme Court. I think the chances are decently high that it does. Okay. Uh, well, great. This has been very, very informative. I appreciate both of you guys talking about this. Phil, I know that we've got an event. I'm going to be attending it on August 17th. Yeah. I believe that's in Springville, Utah. Is that correct? That's correct. So we have a fundraiser that one of our sponsors, Crofter Market, uh, put on for us. It is a basically it's a full day event, but you get to come and get uh, rifle training with uh, Tactical Cowboy, which is one of the top uh, training schools here in Utah. Um, it's all, all part of the ticket. All proceeds go to our lawsuit. So we filed a lawsuit. Um, in the 10th circuit here in Utah against this. And we are seeking uh, relief for the entire American base. Um, but we are also uh, running on donor dollars. So we're trying to do everything we can to raise money so that we can take this all the way to the Supreme Court as necessary. Uh, and so this fundraiser was put on by one of our sponsors to help us raise funds. So there will be tactical training. There's a dinner provided by all local farming producers here in Utah. You get to meet uh, a bunch of big names. You get Greg Matson's going to be there, but uh, uh, Marlo Oaks is going to be there, uh, Utah's treasurer, which you probably are familiar with if you pay anything, pay any attention to um, central bank digital currencies or the yes, things that they're ESG doing with ESGs. And, yeah. yeah. So he'll be there. We have a bunch of community leaders that are all going to be there. So it's going to be a really fun event. Uh, you can go to savetheranchers.com. And that actually will let you get tickets and you can even enter our sweepstakes for free just to help us spread the word. And there's everything there from, you basically can get a quarter of a cow, a bunch of donations from our producers. So like half a pig. So if you want meat, it's on there. <laughs> awesome. I'm very excited about it. I'm actually bringing my wife who's also going to get the tactical training. Uh, and uh, it, it's uh, it's a great deal. So yeah, fundraiser August 17th. I'm going to put the link here in the description box so you guys can go directly to that and see, uh, get a little bit more information on that August 17th. Uh, and of course, say the ranchers, but this applies to all small businesses. And it, and it really That's is correct. a very, very important issue. This transparency, transparency as they try to put something in, in you, know, you know, positive language here is really an encroachment on your privacy. And, and it can affect our businesses uh, in terms of what you're able to do, who you're able to talk to, who you're going to do business with. It's uh, it, it's really very concerning. So I hope that you guys definitely get involved if you are in in the area. Phil and Austin, thank you so much for your time. Maybe we'll circle back and talk a little bit more about this down the road. Awesome. Sounds good. Thanks thank so much you for having us.